Uh, this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, August 3rd, 2023. Um, and Doug, do you mind saying that again? That was really, really cool. <laughs> so there was a program at Caltech called uh, Guests of America, something like that. And it would it paid for interesting people to come and spend two weeks with the stu students. And I was on the committee to show Oppenheimer around when it was his turn to be that person. And the second week, we're walking across the campus, and he says, Doug, what are you going to do when you finish? And he must have picked up some sense that I was not really happy with physics. And I mm -hmm. said, I have no idea. He said, I have a friend who's chair of the psych department at Berkeley, uh, Tolman. Why don't you go up and talk to him? <laughs> so I became, within 48 hours, a grad student at Berkeley. Wow. Love that. That's hilarious. I was on the committee on lectures at UC Irvine, uh, other institutions, and that's how I got to meet the, like the author Mario Vargas Llosa. No, sorry, not Llosa. Fuentes, Carlos Fuentes, uh, many moons ago. Um, and very briefly, he autographed my book and I told him my story. I told him that I, I, I had grown up in Lima. Uh, he was my guest at UC Irvine, and I had also grown up in Argentina. So he signs my book, um, uh, A Mi Amigo. Limeño, Porteño, e Irvineño, su amigo mexiqueño, Carlos Fuentes, which was a pun in Spanish, like instantly delivered. Hmm. Um, so we have a fun format today. Uh, Klaus and Kevin uh, came up with the idea of interviewing one another, since they are both doing things that are near and different and interesting and useful and all of the above. Uh, so I'm going to turn the format over to them and let them sort of lead in any way they'd like to. I'm going to ask uh, my old my old boss, Esther Dyson, is going to show up at probably 35 after. Uh, and I'm driving her to the airport after we chat for a while here. So I'm going to drop off the call um, and we'll ask for who would like to pick up the con and uh, take the call through to where, wherever you'd like to go. Um, any questions, any thoughts before I hand over the con. Everybody's cool. Are you going to have right. Esther pop on and say hi? Um, I think I shall. I'm going to I'm going to unplug my earbuds and, and do that. So it's a good idea. I was thinking the same thing. Um, cool. So um, take it away, Klaus Kevin. Yeah, we haven't had a chance to rehearse now. <laughs> I know. Um, well, we can start open. with me asking you a question or you asking me a question about what you're doing or how you feel about things on the list. Those are, those are two things, I think. Okay. Um, well, my, I'm, I mean, as you know, I've, I've been working uh, on, on food and agriculture mm -hmm. within the context of climate change for some time mm -hmm. now, really since my retirement, almost uh, 2013. Um, and I'm you know, working with the Sierra Club. I'm on the National Grassroots Network team there and uh, Citizen Climate Lobby. Um, they sort of have stepped out of agriculture, but now I'm doing local projects with them. Um, and then a host of other um, NGOs that I got to meet. So I'm sort of in an advisory role to, to these groups. And I sort of step in and out whenever I feel I can make a useful contribution, then I go back and uh, do a presentation or a webinar or, or something. So I typically do maybe two or three uh, webinars a year, and each one of them takes me um, a good three months at least to prepare mm. for. You know, by the time uh, I, I collect the material and every time I advance, you know, I mean, I do these webinars because I really have to pull my thoughts yeah. together and do research and so on so it's very useful for me um and i've always had uh not the good fortune to have really interesting uh panel members you know for who who uh, you can learn from um so that's pretty much so so my my yeah. um go ahead well just so what's the goal of the webinar and who's the audience of the webinar and how is that uh how are new folks finding your webinar? Yeah, so the the 
Um, I mean, I've had in the beginning just a focus on, hey guys, let's pay attention to food and agriculture because uh, they, this is not good news on the horizon. There's a lot of stuff happening in the food system that is just quite simply unsustainable, right? Unsustainable in the context cannot continue in perpetuity. It's going to crash. And that was clear as could be 10 years ago to me when I first got into this. It wasn't clear to me when I was working because I never was exposed to this kind of information, but then it became clear. So about two and a half years ago, I started shifting, and this was with my uh, experience with citizen climate lobby, I became really aware of the legislative process, you know, what, what is happening in Washington and how that impacts the entire system. So I started a book club uh, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, almost on the farm bill within the Sierra Club. And that mushroomed out because they carried this all over the place, kissed the ground, then uh, developed uh, a book club you know, on, this, on the farm bill. And then now everybody now has descended on these farm bill discussions, which is creating huge pressure in Washington um, because... We're talking billions of dollars here at stake, which really drive this entire system. So we have gotten a really thorough understanding of um, of the pathologies you know, that that are being driven by the, the 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 way this money is being allocated to commodity crops. I mean, fruits and vegetables and nuts and all those are specialty crops, right? <laughs> For whatever reason, and regular crops is corn and soy and wheat. Yeah, so uh, so that's so. So I'm now moving on because the farm bill discussions are in full swing. There are there are just a, a, a dozens of NGOs who have swarmed into this field, uh, and there's not much I can contribute at this point. But I'm moving on, and my focus now is. How do you connect farmers who want to shift into regenerative practices with markets? Because the markets are totally controlled, you know, and they are vertically integrated, and the food industry doesn't want to change. It's just as rigid as the oil industry, as the fossil fuel industry, they don't want to change because their business models don't work when you are decentralizing your supply chain and localizing you know, productions and so on. So that's sort of in a, in a nutshell. So so in because of my pivot, you know, towards community based activism, I thought Kevin would be the person to talk with here. Huh. Oh, that's over nice. to you. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I think one of the things uh, I do a lot of national connecting of organizations with funding and partners, and that's where neighborhood economics works. So I'll just describe a little bit that I know what I'm doing there. There's a group of, for example, indigenous uh, entrepreneurs and funds who wanted are saying no to SOCAP, the conference uh, that I used to run, because they want to lump them all into one indigenous bucket. There were three present groups presenting and they said, no, we have one space for indigenous. Y'all find the lowest common denominator. And so we're giving them a space. But the other thing is they want to set the terms of engagement, right? So indigenous deals don't want to deal with exit. If it's working, why would you stop and extract? So that you, you have to do deals that could be intergenerational, you know, that, that you know, the, the typical agreement is until until the, the river stop running, you know, I mean, things fail, but that's the timeline and you have to agree on, on a view of the future. If you're going to co invest together, you know what future are you aiming at and what future are you, are, is the tribe aiming at and those are really, you know, just just figuring that out and so we're going to have one part is we, we will set up a rubric. And you know we don't like exits, and then see what else can happen from that. So that that part's interesting, and we're getting big foundations who, who want to think about it, and they want to think about their power locally. I've been a really, I've had a really interesting failure. Uh, that's uh, I tried to do a donut economics group, uh, which was based in a bioregion. It turns out donut economics is much better in a city, um, but we had multiple reasons we failed. Uh, 
that are that are worth talking about. Uh, and but we're reconstituting as circles uh, where we have a methodology. With the problem with donut is that they give you a toolkit with what you should make the pieces into. You know, you create a portrait of your community, and then you do this, and then you do that. I think it, it, it was too hard for everybody to get the high concept. And so we're going to go with circles that guide you, that have a methodology, and, and we'll go from there and, and build it on. What the people really wanted was relationship with folks who cared. We're not going to let anybody who is a just collapser have the floor. I'm sorry, but we're just not. We're, we're, we're looking at things like Ayana Johnson's new book, you know, What If It Would Get It Right?, and we're looking at this, what then can we save as the book and methodology? And uh, we found that uh, having just collapsers in destroyed any, anybody's ability to hope. And they just thought they were being diligent to let us know how bad it was, could get. So we were saying, fine, stay out. Anyway, that's a limit. Um, and um, so we're just figuring out, I mean, you know, a bunch of people still want it. We we just did it wrong in lots of ways, which I could go into. But there was, you know, we we gave the, the telling the story and building the thing to one guy whose English wasn't very good, who's who's uh, was really brilliant, but he wasn't charismatic, and nobody followed him. And you know, we just did a lot of things wrong. But I think still a local group that wants to understand what's happening. And they want to find local climate action. Is is the is we have the same goal? Donut did might have worked in the city. It's working in Birmingham, UK, and other places. But it it didn't for us. A lot of it was user error. So that's where we are. So so did you did you have a specific uh, a target or specific goal in mind, or was this well, more generic? Yeah, we wanted to, you know, make the Swannanoma watershed thrive. And that is basically our little river that goes from above Black Mountain to it ends into the uh, French Broad uh, at the Biltmore Estate and in, in, in Asheville. So just this part of the county. One of the big goals is that one of the poorest neighborhoods is at the foot of the watershed called Shiloh and they got moved to create the Biltmore Estate and Biltmore Forest which is an exclusive little place and um, they're unhealthy and so we're working with things around social determinants of health there and also the unfair taxation and we've got a whole really good project working there because they've been overtaxed by a million and a half while Biltmore Forest has been undertaxed by four and a half million but the, the, the assessors also kept their valuations low, so nobody can get a second mortgage. And we have folks working on that now, or you know, and looking at the health impact and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So have you done anything in food and agriculture? Well, yeah, we've got a a watershed fund that is fixing to start. It's a zero interest, uh, ten thousand dollar loans. Um, to farm to table uh, farmers who are, are their major customers are these restaurants and so we, you know, we're talking to the restaurants uh, about doing a benefit dinner and that you know the the farmer has to have ten thousand dollars in on tap social capital in the network to become a uh, a, a, a borrower uh, and so we, and we think we can do that pretty easily because you know we're a big farm to table place you couldn't do it in Greenville South Carolina but you can do it here and, uh, and, the, and the restaurants brag about, you know, I source from them. Well, you know, they need, they always need 60 or 80,000, but they always have a $10,000 project. And so, the, and, and the farmers are having to understand this kind of money they've never seen. So what else do you get? No, you just give us the $10,000 back. It's like, well, and what's it cost me? Well, just paying back the money, you know, and the three years of, of trusted relationship, one year of trusted relationship and two years of paying back. Um, and so we think that, you know, it's a model that can replicate any, anywhere you have a viable farm to table culture, we think. And we can, there's some food security angles to that too, but yeah. So who, who manages that program, Kevin? Uh, Eagle Market Streets, which is the CDC that is also managing our community equity fund, which is we raised about $3 million in to solve the problem of uh, 
friends and family funding for entrepreneurs, uh, black sole proprietors, you know, 90% of all black businesses are sole proprietors, never grow to the fourth employee. And so it's because they don't have the right kind of capital. CDFIs are not built to solve the problem that they're built to solve. Uh, they, you need collateral. So we give them, you know, equity and uh, two, uh, two years of runway, and then they pay back revenue share, and then they graduate to uh, being uh, CDFI loans. And, and we, we're in the county's budget for two years. We're, we, we've proven to be a low cost job creator. So, you know, it, it, they're taking us to scale. So they're, they're also going to manage the, the watershed fund. We, we're just telling the story and doing the community engagement. People have to learn how to give to invest, which is a real cultural thing that makes a lot of sense in Europe and Asia and is almost not done here. Hmm. So, so what are your, your plans? I mean, what do you have on the, on the calendar that uh, comes up next? Well, you know, our conference is in... Um, February, you know, we're a neighborhood economics in San Antonio with a couple deep local partners. Uh, and, you know, our, our goal is, you know, now we, we've got some new staff, a guy from the local CDFI who built a, uh, a startup fund for marginalized, uh, uh, you know, folks, uh, and, but he's left to, to join us. And uh, so he, he can do a lot of the practical stuff around my ideas, but then he'll be taken over. He also speaks foundation well, you know, and he talks to institutions and stuff. And I, I get him in the conversation, but I can't, you know, he does like bullet points and tight, you know, uh, uh, lists of things and all that, you know, which is, you know, what I'm not capable of really. I, I can engage him with, with a, a new story, but, but, you know, I feel like uh, Curious George when I'm around bullet points, like I swing from one and then I hope I make it to the other. But he can he can he can he can do bullet points and they like bullet points. It's not easy to do bullet points. Yeah. Yeah, I have, you know. Yeah. 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 So so I just I'm just starting a project here in Bend. Um, so with the with the local citizen climate lobby chapter, uh, so we contacted uh, one of the largest breweries here. It's a brew pub, Worthy Brewing, um, and the owner of that uh, operation is is quite environmentally oriented. So he's growing his own hops, and he has an herbal garden for his restaurant and things like that. So we, uh, I contacted the Kiss the Grant group, so they gave me permission to use their film in an abbreviated version, um, which is like a 45 minute uh, a clip that focuses really on soil health. How do you, and why it's so important, you know, water retention and all of that. So we'll do that. And then I have invited the local uh, soil and water conservation district that they have already agreed to, to uh, join for a panel discussion and a farmer and a caterer and then we want to, to have a conversation. Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry, do you have your hand up? I do, but I'm happy to wait until you're done with what you're saying. Okay. Um, so so the idea then is that we have a panel discussion. So now we have made you, the, the audience, aware. And we'll have room for about 100 people or so. And uh, we'll, we'll really heavily uh, advertise this in the community in Bend. Um, hmm. So, so then we'll have uh, no, a discussion where the federal government just put $19.5 billion into the conservation programs, uh, which are you know, designed to assist farmers to shift into regenerative practices and to build local marketplaces. And so we want to have a discussion where the USDA representative explains the options, what is available not for restaurant operators and caterers, not to apply for not just grants, but also for technical know-how. Because in order to stitch together a supply chain, you need from the farmer, you need an aggregator, you need a processor, you need logistics and so on. And everything has to be aligned, right? I mean, you have to get menus changed in the restaurant and that has to be communicated to the farmer and back and forth until you establish a supply demand uh, uh, equation, which then runs across the supply chain. So, um, so it's, it's 
great that uh, on the one hand that I got this instant interest here in Bend, but what's really yeah. nerving is people just don't have a clue. I mean, they just they just don't know um, what this is and why this is, right? Jerry, here you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know. It, it put my hand down automatically after a while, I guess. Uh, so I have a question that, that was originally for Kevin and I think is for both of you at this point, which is um, there's, Kevin started uh, along with a couple other people, including his wife, uh, Rosalie, uh, the SOCAP conferences, social capital, and the tagline for SOCAP was, if I remember properly, Kevin, where money meets meaning. And it was really interesting because you you attracted a bunch of people who were from like banks and normal financial institutions who were kind of scratching around for what's going on in these other funny markets. And then you also had a whole bunch of activists and other people. It was a very nice mix. And it feels to me like your whole, much of your late career, you've been experimenting with the relationship between money and actual real life and sort of sustainable mm -hmm. life and uh conviviality if you want to borrow Illich's phrase or something like that like how, how do we how do we repurpose money in some way and so I guess my question is do you have any lessons you can share with us about what have you learned from that quest because you're you're still on that quest it feels like it's a very deep quest for you and very meaningful and does it mean what is and I'm gonna I'm gonna apply my own point of view here. What is corrupting about capitalism that breaks the way money ought to work? And how might it be fixed? Is it about scale? Is it about ownership? As I put in the chat, is it something else? And then Klaus, it it feels like this question comes over to you in the sense of how do we fix the the food system? Is it about scale? Is it about ownership? Is it about commons? Is it about something else? So I, I think this is a parallelism in some sense in both of your quests. So. So you don't break capitalism at the top. You subvert redlining in your town. You know, uh, it's, it, you can much more, you know, like Ostrom, I'm always about, there's a polycentric way to do it. Uh, and, you know, you can show the, the county assessor that unfair taxation costs the county a couple million. You know, that's what the project with, with well, you know, Joe Menacosi, which, you know, and he's really taking things to scale. And we're doing stuff here, so uh, you subvert redlining where you can, and you, you that means you can change valuations, you can change appraisals, and you can get the the folks to do it because they make more money doing it. So that's like just a thing. Um, but the other part is, we, you know, we really decided a, ne a neighborhood focus was the deal because you know you, your zip code is a greater determiner of your health and your wealth and your mortality than your DNA code. And so we want to build relationships across zip codes in the places we work, uh, helping you know affluent folks become effective allies and not intrusive uh, solution stampers. Uh, so you know, help working with uh, community directed capital is what we're leaving behind after our conference in Jackson. And I can go into it, but it's you know, community directed capital is is becoming a thing. Uh, where you don't just make the poor folks fit your theory of change. And then, you know, the poor folks get besieged by more consultants when they get the philanthropic dollars because they have to keep proving themselves a quarter of the way through rather than halfway through. So the cost of the dollars, and then they never get 90% of the best philanthropic money is what's called unrestricted operating. That just means we trust you, you do it. Black folks get less than 10% of it. Uh, Southwest uh, um, uh, Hispanic folks that we're working with in Texas get less than 10% of it because it's built on relationships and the foundation folks have relationships with white groups. Actually, it becomes 96% of all unrestricted operating in uh, groups working with black youth are white led that get these grants because they trust black men less just that's what they do. Um, so, uh, so you know, that's part of that. Um, we're also looking at how that becomes an evergreen fund that, you know, where you concessionary investments that are catalytic. So I think the big thing is I helped venture philanthropy not catch on in the U.S. I stopped inviting Acumen Fund and New Profit and the few venture philanthropy funds, which is giving to invest. 
because I be, I was a market zealot at the time. I wanted to show the market worked. And when I start working locally, I know that philanthropy really matters. And that uh, there are these catalytic foundations who are doing the four things of being catalytic is that you have to understand this, it's concessionary. There's a cost of doing good. You can't do good at market rate. You can be patient, you can be flexible and you can take a risk and losing some of it is okay. Then you need, and then affluent folks are, are starting to follow that kind of model, but there's no real grassroots local initiative except one in the country, a thing called abundance capital in Greenville, South Carolina, which is affluent people giving to invest that has a return and, and capital expenditure and their first two deals were uh, a uh, expanding a kitchen for women coming out of the sex trade and CapEx helping them go to some scale and a similar thing for former incarcerated manufacturing. But you need all the handholding to learn how to do this, uh, to give to invest and realize the money will be coming back and your $5 comes back in four years and it goes out again. And you can actually tag that $5, you can see your money you know, my five dollars is working there now, uh, but I only and now it's, so there's ten dollars of impact, but I only put in five. So nobody has the story of this new kind of money. So I think it's a real secret tool, and I want to help people figure that out. And so that's what I'm working on. Yeah, I tell you, I'm really conflicted. I was in a meeting yesterday, a uh, big group meeting uh, hosted by the Forum for the Future uh, Coalition, a uh, whole bunch of NGOs in there. Um, and I, I, I just had to bring to their attention that you take all farmers markets and all CSAs combined, and it's 3% of total market. But yet the energy that goes into uh, uh, this 3% is completely disproportionate uh, with, uh, with any potential outcomes. And there are such wonderful initiatives right, uh, that you see in communities. And it really captures the energy of, of so many nonprofit groups and local groups. So they start spinning. You know, it's actually, I mean, maybe I'm just sort of cynical, but the Wallace Center. You know, for, I mean, funded by the Walton family, has had this um, uh, uh, organization that supports the development of local food hubs. And there are there are food hubs all over the place, uh, you know, and 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 they're funded, and two thirds of them lose money, and hardly any one achieves you know, more than maybe a million or two million in sales. And it just concentrates the energy of so many people, you know, into doing things that just that just can't scale. Now, if Walmart wanted to scale, you know, the these food hubs, they would buy from them, you know, they would integrate them into their supply chain, but they don't. So they, they have to develop their own markets and their own outlets and these CSAs that just takes so much effort, right? But it just it just has no practical chance of scaling really. And uh and so uh um the the I, I got you no know, con I, I got I inserted myself with the climate reality project. You now I went to this Al Gore uh, uh, presentation there and that was like in April and it was like not one word about nature-based solutions, right? All the uh, you know, big uh, uh, administrative uh, ideas and stuff. So I contacted them and they gave me access to their mailing list, which is like 96 chapters in North America. And I gave them an outline how many organizations are working on stuff already that is related to you know, food and agriculture, but also land use issues in, in, in broader term. But when you think about land use, 80% of all water is used by agriculture. So when you want to talk about land use, you have to prioritize what you're looking at, right? Because it's it's uh, agriculture that is dominating the, the, the space, right? But there's no real focus and discussion on that. And so I, they asked me, you know, to their credit, they asked me to uh, give a... Uh, you no, know, a presentation. So the San Antonio chapter invited me to do, you know, to do an overview. I did that, and then the training director uh, uh, is you now is now they are now developing a training course focused on 
you know, food and agriculture, you know, a, a regenerative agriculture, basically. And they asked me to develop an introduction uh, uh, clip for this. So I shot a 15 minute video and a PowerPoint to introduce the topic. And I wanted to put in as much shock value you know, as, as, as I could. Um, can I take the screen for a moment? I can just uh, take you five minutes here to, to uh, show show you some slides that I that I did here. Um, let me see. Can do a slideshow. Um, so so this is why food is the next frontier in climate, and you have basically two options. You know, you have you have energy, which everybody understands, and you have photosynthesis. Uh, which is really nature-based solutions, which, you know, 80% of water you know, is being used for um, food production, for agriculture. And uh, uh, yeah, so so then here's the Yale Climate Connection is basically saying that, you know, absent any dietary uh, changes, uh, 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 any revolutionary changes in dietary patterns or agricultural production practices, we're going to fly right by uh, the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius ceiling, which we're going to do anyways. Um, and uh, hold on, my computer just falls up. And then food, and this is really this came new. So, so I got into an argument with with one of the, the climate reality guys. They wanted to to claim 11 percent uh, contribution to emissions. To, uh, related to agriculture. I said, okay, that's a correct number, but you're missing the picture here. You're comparing apples with oranges because when you look at, you have to look at food as a system because you can't separate storage and packaging, transportation, thousands of miles and, so, and all these other things, you know, from, from this list here. So on top of it, 40% of all food is wasted. So now comes the recognition that one third of global emissions are directly linked to the food system. You know, and, and the reason this is important is because you're allocating capacity you know, to where the biggest problems are. And we haven't, we talk about land use about trees, right? Which is great, but it's not really addressing the core issue yet. Then chemical contamination, I mean, everybody knows what a mess that is, right? It's uh, the personal health issues because chemicals are penetrating the food supply, getting into our body. It's the, our 50% of our watersheds are polluted and, and so on and so on. And then 60% um, of our healthcare bill is directly linked to, to a nutrient deficient diet. Now, so to miss that focus on soil health. Now, why is soil health so important? Um, 50 to 70 percent of, of, of carbon has been depleted from soils. Now, I mean, this is global. <laughs> People don't realize that. I mean, this is serious stuff, right? 25 percent of global emissions up in the, in the atmosphere come from decarbonizing soil. I mean, that's, you know, forget the transportation center. You know, here it is. And then conversely, the IPCC is now saying we could, we could uh, sequester 1.85 gigatons of carbon each year if we go to scale on shifting into regenerative practices. And that you, you could do that for 20 to 40 years. Yeah? Um, then here, you know, the, the, these chemicals that they're using is trying out the soil and when you try out the soil, it loses its capacity to hold water. So you have millions of square miles of land mass, former grasslands and what have you, that, have, that are dried out and they're disrupting the water cycle. You know, 60% of local rain typically comes from the, from the tran, evapotranspiration, you know, where, where uh, this, the moisture in the soil evaporates and rains back down. Uh, so then here, healthy soil. 1% increase in organic matter gives you 20,000 gallons storage capacity per acre. Yeah? And typically you have 4 to 10% of organic matter in healthy soil. These are massive volumes of water. When you think California has 34 million acres of farmland, right? I mean, 1% increase, you have millions of uh, uh, acre feet of, uh, of water. So where to engage? Pathways to market now. You know, somehow you need to you need to engage 
uh, uh, the market to work to partner with the customer. You know, he's called in the Institute of America, the the uh, with Harvard, you know, menus of change. You know, the bioregions concept. We talked about that. You know, that uh, it's like think of Europe as bioregions, you know, and how cuisines have evolved over time. You know, to specialize into you know German and Japan and Greece and so on into bioregions, what can be produced generation after generation, time after time. You know? um, and so USDA is, is starting to help, you know, with very specific local market development programs. They're funding it. The corporations you know, are telling us they're going to do it. Of course, not much has happened yet. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but I mean, the, the, the understanding is there. It's just like with the oil industry, the understanding is there that we need to shift you know but it's you know, it's not happening so farmers need and so on so anyway i just uh wanted to, to run you through there so i i, I laid the, the a foundation there to to directly approach uh everyday you know uh, uh, consumers and and uh, people who are not familiar you know with the issues at large just to to uh um just to get there, the four per thousand initiative Gil, is doing great. Um, they have really gone global uh, with that because the United Nations, they were a key uh, factor in the 2021 United Nations Food Systems Summit. Um, and the European Union has embraced the farm to table, they're calling it farm to fork coming out of this. So four per thousand is doing great. Jerry. Um, plus, I'm gonna interrupt for a second. Um, Esther's just arrived, and um, I'm gonna drop okay. off. But uh, Gil or Pete, can I pass the con to either of you? Or are you gonna be here for the rest of the call? I'm not sure I will, so maybe not me. Gil, I I can't. I'm doing. I'm working on a plumbing problem in my kitchen. Oh well, my gosh, Stuart, yeah, somebody else. Uh, sure, I'll take it. Excellent. And uh, let me just unplug my earbud. Let me put Esther on for a second. Here, I'll come over. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. What a wonderful, I don't know, reunion or something. It's, it's great. Open global model. Jerry and I are here together, which is yeah. really nice. Yeah. Um, good to see you all, but I don't want to interrupt. So, no worries. Let We're going to sit and talk, on. and I will pass the, the, the con. Thanks. Ba -da -ba. Jerry, remind Esther we're coming back. Oh, well, all right. I forgot me. Never mind. But Kevin, is this is this kind of <coughs> information too much? I mean, when you when you think about your community and your audience, how how would something like this play? Um, it would probably scare them. Is that a good thing? I don't think so. I think people are already afraid and therefore petrified and are not moving. And if you come in and you scare them more, they will have shut down. So I don't, you know, I'm more interested in the what if we got it right parts of things and where the system can be moved and where there are inflection points. And, you know, Danella Meadows, where is that system? You know, I, I have zero interest in hearing how it's not going to work. But if you can find the, the, the inflection point where the system could be moved, I'm interested. Uh, so that's just me. You know, we need to talk about this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and that's a blind alley. Well, then I don't need to hear about blind alleys. I want to hear where there's a, a chink in the wall. So that's, I, I have zero patience for blind alley conversations. Because, you know, you end up in a blind alley. Yeah. No. It, it, it seems there are several parts to the presentation, and they can be dialed up or down for different audiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, know, like, you do want doom and fear, and you should, yeah, I mean, you should give it well, to them. Well, let me just say, there's there's like one part that like things are really, you know, things are really shitty and in big trouble and getting worse. That's one part. Second is the diagnosis of why it is that way, which starts to point you to what the leverage points are. Uh, and then third is, here's what people are doing, you know, in places like yours or all around the world that are actually working, contributing, and making progress. And fourth is, okay, what are we going to do here? And yeah. You, 
and you dial those pieces up and down based on the audience you're in. Some people need to really get hit over the head. Yeah. Your guys don't. They need to know like what's working and how can we apply that here. Yeah. Yeah. That toolbox. I mean, class is a great presentation, but uh, you know, to to Kevin's point, valving what's right for what audience make would would really cr crank it up a bunch. I think. Yeah, I'm not going to show the introduction part of this presentation to my group here in Bend. You know, I'm going to start at menus of change. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, because here they're showing, uh, we're showing the film Kiss the Ground, which is all positive and, you know, the heal healing the soil and so on and so on. And then say, okay, let's do this, but here's what it takes to do it. You know, right. we need to, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm personally, I'm just figuring out how. I, you know, I did it wrong one time. We did a lot of things right, but you know, people didn't want a toolkit they put together. They want to be guided, and and you you can have deep conversation. I, I think the circles model around conversations uh, from that book. You know, what then can we say? And from or the other woman who's doing that that book is, what if we get it right? And I just. We, we have a real small window that we need to like get, not be angry and be smart. So, yeah. Well, you've got, Doug, you got your hand raised for something. Yeah, I was, I, I'm, I'm curious what, whether you guys could point in the direction of things that have been sort of farmer directed. um for farmers that are in the current system you know that are currently um you know part of the of the old paradigm and frame and and what kinds of things farmers are my experience with farmers i'm in southwest michigan which is farm you know very much farm territory and farmers are sort of a breed apart especially multi-generational, you know, like they're a unique species. <laughs> and and, and I, I tend to orient around these kinds of um, centers of gravity um, through a constituency lens, like who are all the constituent players at the table, mm -hmm. but unconditional love applied what does each constituent need to feel loved in the way they want to be loved? Like, what mm. does each constituent need to receive the information that you ideally would like them to receive? And, and that can change really dramatically depending upon yeah. who you're talking to. And I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm sitting in the middle of a lot of connectivity to a lot of farm folk and the suppliers and the chemical providers and the fertilizer providers and the you know the truckers and logistics people and the heavy equipment people that you know um but at the belly of that beast are the farmers themselves yeah i have two quick answers you know one we're in a not common farm to table place that's also got a gentle climate. And so a lot of farmers have moved in to be farmers here or had a theory of earth or whatever, and they're becoming viable. Uh, so that's, you know, so we're working on that, you know, the stored gratitude that they have in the network that can result in 10,000, that can you know, start a habit. And then the people who have done that will also, they will have given to invest. And so we want to talk to them about helping to understand their experience. And so, It'll be popular because it's you know it's a benefit dinner you know from a, a farm that supplies well so, so, and it's listed on the menu you know in, in these restaurants. And we're also working with Equal Plates, which does the same kind of meals to folks who can't afford those restaurants, and so they serve them to Head Starts and you know uh, senior centers, and and they'll be they'll have a brief presentation in there, and we want people to give in addition uh, to the folks who can't be at the at that meal, you know, there's, there's always, you know, a little bit more liberal guilt you can milk out of the fragile environmentalists who come, who care about food systems and, uh, and, and getting them to actually care about something other than the climate is, is, is 
you got to make it quick and, and not make them think about that too long. Another thing that I helped with was helping Regen Illinois uh, get into a, a hospital system with regenerative oats. And we had a miller <clears throat> who could do it at scale and there was enough supply. But then it took about five years going through this hospital because you know they, they had to see that it worked and then they had to do test gardens that it worked and then they had to do testing with the nutritionist that it worked and then they had to do testing in the lab that it worked and then they had to go you know, so it was like all the labs had to see it you know it, the real stuff and, and regenerative oats is really healthier and you know you had to buy a 200,000 oat steamer to bring that to scale and so you know the enterprise penetration you know you need, as, as I put it in our system, you have, need a system on the road is knitting all the, the stakeholders and partners together. And the stakeholders are those you want to move and partners are the ones who are helping you do it. And um, knitting those together, but then uh, the mother hen role where there was one woman who just lived in the nutrition lab and the, all the labs, you know, to, to make each scientist move the project faster, a little bit more and to figure out what, the, you know, so five years was really short, you know, because she was working every angle, but you need somebody with that kind of patience who can go to see the same people moving them. And so you can do that shit, but it's, 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 it's a heavy lift and you need a system entrepreneur, you know, you, you need, uh, you know, an anchor institution who wants to move there and will make more money doing it because eating healthier keeps you uh, out of the emergency room and all those sorts of things that anchor hospitals are doing. So it's a real system play linked to the farm, linked to, you know, the, the next thing is ground beef and they're working on ground beef, but the easiest was oats. So anyway, that, those, that's my, those are my two experiences. Thanks. Yeah, I just posted uh, a webinar that I was uh, doing in partnership also with the uh, movie maker from uh, Farm Free or Die. So there are some some really specific uh, references from farmers speaking, you know, in this in this uh, uh, clip here. Um, so so what we have, I mean, I've had uh, farmers on the panel that have like ten thousand acres, right? I mean, big farmers and but progressive. They're all worried about losing their soil. I mean, they realize that if their soil goes, their farm goes. So that's the starting point. Yeah. You know? And then you say, okay, so what does it take uh, to to repair your soil? Because the word regenerate and, and why this became dominant is because we're beyond sustainable, right? It's not, you can't sustain what we have right now because it's already highly degraded. So you have to repair and regenerate your soil. And here are the steps to do this. Um, but then the farmer go, in, in this movie, Farm Free or Die, there is a very specific reference where one lady farmer is talking about how much money it costs for them to change out their equipment. I mean, they, they have millions of dollars of, of stuff, you know, st st sitting on those farms. And so they need help with that. And they say, why, why would we pay, you know, to repair your watershed? Um, why, why should this come out of my pocket? I'm willing to do it, but you then will better pay me for it. So that's sort of what farmers are saying, right? And so, Right now, you have the the U.S. government, the Inflation Reduction Act, put you know twenty billion dollars into the conservation programs for specifically that reason. Of course, the Republicans want to kill it and take it back out. I mean, that's the insanity of our time, you know. But so then the other thing that that is promising but yet not explored are carbon markets. Because if you can pay farmers for, for, for the sequestration of carbon into the soil, then you have the incentive, right? If you pay them up front through grants to buy equipment and you know, put in cover crops and so on, that's one thing. But then you can reward them you know, through carbon markets where you get you know, X amount of money per ton of carbon sequestered. And, and none of the, this is all potential. Now, this could all happen, but it's not yet. No. Okay, Stuart, I'm sorry we have kept you waiting here. No, no worries. Uh, one, I want to really salute both of you guys. Um, kudos for being on the ground and on the front lines with this. If you think about this as a war, in some ways, you guys are really on the front lines. And it's, you know, um, it's just beautiful to hear and watch. One of the things that struck me as you were as you were talking 
was um, the importance of getting the large um, food purveyors to get on to get on board in in some way, and it brought to mind um, a, a couple that I met many years ago, who um, believe it or not were selling helicopters <laughs> to large corporations, <laughs> and what they came to realize was that there were you know fifteen twenty different entities they had to deal with to get decisions made. And so they developed a whole system to move large corporate entities into actual systems, uh, into decisions. And I'm just wondering, I was wondering where the where the holdup is in the large corporations. Is it at the top level? It, you know, where is it? Is that nobody wants to make decisions about shifting? And then as I was as I was waiting to um to just to to throw this out to find out where the bottleneck is, um, I started to think about you know um, so corporations are you know financed by banks and shareholders and and uh, you know the importance of of getting that piece uh, into the chain and in terms of you know large philanthropists you know, creating a bank of, of progressive thinking people to help finance things and move things along. I'm just, I'm just rambling a little bit now, but any, any thoughts about what I just said? Yeah. Kevin, do you want to go? No, I have no thoughts about what he just said. It's not where <laughs> I mean, okay. you know, it's important, but it's not my space. The, the, uh... The phenomena in the food business is the same as in the oil industry. You know, the, you have the equivalency of the Koch brothers uh, uh, who own. Uh, I mean, think about. Uh, let's just take McDonald's, right? Uh, Thirty-four thousand restaurants, uh, all with the same menu. Um, they want to have that potato uh, uh, precisely, you know, grown to their specifications. Uh, it's a it's a poisonous mess. That they're creating with this it's a gmo potato that you know requires massive chemical intervention to grow and so you but, but if you were to change their potato you know if you were to tell them stop growing this thing it's killing you know everything around it because you have to douse it with insecticides and herbicides and you know and, and put in uh, you know phosphates and synthetic nitrogen it just kills everything like you go to idaho my god there's no it's a wasteland and we're no uh, millions of acres there but for them to change that potato they would have to to change the aggregation practices right if you say let's you guys grow potatoes that are conducive to your bio uh, system right to your bio region there are different types of potatoes, right? I mean, they're, they're, this potato grows really well in cold climates. This potato does better in, in hot climates. So if you grow potatoes that are conducive to the, to the soil and to the bioregion, then now McDonald's has to start aggregating potatoes that are different. That means the entire processing system collapses. Right. So these large restaurant chains and catering organizations uh, have to would have to regionalize their production centers. You know, they would have to build regional kitchens or processing centers to supply you know, a, a group of restaurants. So it is it is very disruptive and which is why they're fighting it. That they, they just don't want to deal with it. And it's when you look at legislation, I mean, you have states you know, who are going anti-ESG, you know, environmental sustainability goals, who have anti-ESG legislation coming in, you know, where they penalize anybody who wants to invest, you know, in companies that are openly stated we are, we are uh, pro, pro environmental regulations and stuff. So there, there is, um, I mean, there is a, a, a perversion that has been built into the system, you know, a pathology that you can't get out without really changing the whole damn system. Yeah. So you just described two blind alley scenarios, one, you know, with uh, the big ag and, and the other. Uh, with given Stewart's questions, have you found some places where there's leverage points to change the system that's possible? 
and 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 no, don't do a, another blind alley scenario. Yeah, no, I mean, we know the way out, right? And we need to have uh, people become activist enough to understand what the issues are. So this is a dilemma, <laughs> right? Um, and not everybody, not everybody needs to be in this fight. So when, when I go and talk to my local uh, the restaurant owners and so on, I don't mention that stuff, you know, that. Uh, but when you are talking with people who are into political activism or into lobbying and talking to the economy, I mean, you got to know this stuff. You, you have to hold your congressperson and your senator accountable, right? That means you have to know. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. yeah. No, we, 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 blind we, 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 Doug, yeah. go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, is there a model for doing soil regeneration one acre at a time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you have farmers who may have you know, 10,000 acres and they take aside maybe a 50 acre plot to experiment. No, that's that's absolutely happening. And then you have small scale farmers you know, who, who and we are really wanting to encourage small scale farmers, you know, three, four or five acre farmers to, to be multi-crop. Well, have... let's, let's come down to uh, suburban living and uh, the houses with a suburban garden that's maybe half an acre. Is there a procedure there to regenerate that soil? Yes, they, when you go on USDA website, there is urban agriculture. Um, and it's a big thing and it's growing like crazy. Kevin would probably know more about it. Yeah, but, you know, there's a farm uh, here that uh, is in uh, five yards. But she she does regenerative food production in those yards and is sourcing from them. She's trying to raise money to to make a farm, but she's got a really viable business, uh, leasing yards uh, and and managing them extremely uh, efficiently. Vanna Roddy, I, I think she has she's published uh, some books. R O D D Y. I forget the name of her farm on how to look at your land. And and uh, how to do what what she's done? She's she's really smart and can, you know, I think she's got a lot of potential to guide people into you know food forest production or food net food foresty networks uh, in your yards. I mean, when you think during World War II, forty percent of U.S. foods and vegetables came from uh, uh, what was it called uh, uh, Victory Gardens, right? 40% during that time. So it's absolutely, you could scale that. Uh, if people get it, right, if people understand this, uh, this could scale in a really short period of time. I'm needing to go in about five minutes if anybody has anything for me, or otherwise I'll just listen. One of the things that's pretty obvious in your presentations is the money system remains in place. Uh, is that a stumbling block? Well, you know, you have to change what you do with capital and how you think about money. I mean, you know, um, individually and collectively. You know, I mean, that, this this giving to invest is a it's a major force that is scaling in Asia and Europe, and it, it, you can you can point to one active fund domestically here, we call New Profit. So I think there is, a, you know, donor advice funds local investing locally. I think as a real good replicable model, there's only one of those. And uh, it takes a lot of hand holding and, and some expertise that's local, you know, uh, but I, I think it's 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 like that thing they've done is so powerful in that one town. And they're now they're coming up here because people are seeing it. And the big hospital foundation said, yeah, bring that up here and we'll do social determinants of health stuff. So I, I think I think to me, collective local bioregional climate change response is the only way we're going to survive and re rejiggering the capital system is part of that and starting to care about everybody in the watershed is part of that. But there's holes everywhere. Yeah, what Kevin just mentioned is basically the what, what we refer to as the socioeconomic impact 
of of decisions and um it's just astounding to see how um how decisions are being made without uh, really respecting the socioeconomic consequences you know what does this do to i mean why do we have food deserts it's basically because no one pays attention to the base of pyramid economy you know do these people have access to uh, affordable fresh food or you know what would it take to make this work you know? So I think uh, uh, you know Kevin is right in, in saying that the socioeconomic issues are actually going to be dominant, you know, to make this work, to to turn this. Yeah, they're not going to stay down the hill as climate change happens. You know, they're they're, they're going to threaten the the gated communities. Will discover, you know, that the gate is uh, just a, an interesting piece of iron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do you guys see that see you know the work on the ground that you're doing um <clears throat> going viral in any way that is actually going to change the uh, uh you know the projection that we're on yeah i i have an actual real answer to that um some things will be viral and are easily replicable and some things repl replicate as ecosystem replication that's deeply socially constructed you know we're working with and the aspen institute you know they're big dogs whatever and we're in the room with them now with a, a project we've been working with uh, there were four projects and this is the one that's easily scaling and it's a guy converting uh black strip malls and they're just called black wall streets to uh, local ownership and keeping it away from predatory hedge fund displacement and then kicking out the dirty dollar stores and trying to find a decent local business to build it up. But it works and he's done it four times in Chicago and Baltimore two each. And uh, my family's invested in him and, and he's the most e easily templatable of any of the things that's out there really. There's a couple of things that you know fit a certain kind of capital that, that are also like that, the, the equity part that would let black owner, uh, black business owners buy their building uh, because CDFIs don't don't give loans to people that need them, but only the people that that don't really need them. So it's the equity part that helps them become uh, you know asset owners. So you know, crowdfunding commercial elements in commercial real estate is a really big thing because you know in Baltimore one of the things that made it work was they got a thousand people engaged and then the people walking by owned the block. You know. And then the there were hedge fund folks came around deeply connected, you know, from the other part of town. But the city councilman was out front saying, I'm behind my thousand people. In fact, I'm leading them right now. <laughs> you know, and so you know, you, you can get political cover if you get a lot of voters engaged in owning the block. So things like that can grow. Uh, that's the easiest one uh, that can grow. But lots of things grow the way watershed restoration grows. You know, it's a whole complex of factors that needs to be socialized and you need to find where's the anchor institution that, you know, could make make money, save money, hospital, university, government, you know, never leads. You get out in front of where government wants to solve a problem and then they will give you money to scale. But don't ever ask government to lead to change because it just they won't and, and you'll be stuck and it's wrong but you know they're, they're funding our community equity fund that's solving friends and family funding for uh, sole proprietors to become job creators because we've become a, a, a reliable low-cost job creator so they're they're jumping out in front and saying we're so happy you know but the government can bring things to scale that uh, you know uh, once you prove it works so anyway Ecosystem grow is complex contagion. Linear's mm -hmm. is one of the things that's a template that can fit lots of places. So, so would you guys would you categorize the work that you're doing in some way as a parallel process that hopefully at some point in time will um, become the more dominant process because those large purveyors that are killing things um, will see that there is no alternative as people stop um, um, using what they're providing? I have a quick answer to that. And I was talking to a guy who runs a refugee resettlement center in Thailand yesterday. I said, how do you keep hope alive? You know, there's 90,000 <laughs> refugees in your town and nobody wants them. 
And uh, we said, you know, uh, Brian Stevenson, who does the uh, Justice Project in, in Alabama, he yep. says what he does is he doesn't focus on the horizon. He focuses on what's proximate and what can happen. I mean, it's some version of a serenity prayer, you know, courage to change the things you can and the, the, uh, the, don't do the things you can't do. And so, you know, when, so when you talk about how do you make the big thing move, you know, you, you can change the economy of a neighborhood, but I can't imagine how to change the economy of a country. So, you know, a country is built up a lot of neighborhoods, then you get regional. So I, I'm, I'm, I think you can uproot things from below a lot easier. You know, you can find ways to subvert redlining and change the economy. But, you know, questions about how, how will this get big and looking at big, it's just, I don't look there. I, I wouldn't, if you only see a blind alley there, then stop looking there. Look in places where there's not blind alleys, you know, look where there's leverage points. So that's, yeah. I avoid yeah. that question. Thank you. <laughs> Great. No, it's also the admonition of do what you can where you are with what you have. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But there's also, you know, another thought process here. Um, the so I, I compare this a little bit, you know, in like a, when I was in Tanzania watching the Great Migration, right? So you have all the wildebeest and zebras running over back and forth, trying to figure out uh, how to cross this this river that's full of uh, you know, really big crocodiles, and they can't make up that they just keep running back and forth and back and forth until one finally decides, you know, a small group, and then boom, the whole thing goes. So we are on the precipice of people wanting action because the climate, I mean, climate change is now so obvious and, and, and uh, it's just a matter of time until we lose a city, right? I mean, the, the oceans are so heated up. I mean, the next storm system, system coming through the Gulf of Mexico may take out Houston, right? I mean, the, 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 we are really, you know, one fraction away from, from a major catastrophe someplace. And so when that happens, people will look to act, right? And then, then you say, so what do you, and then the risk is, you know, that that makes things worse because uh, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have, you know, sufficient alignment across a broad spectrum of people you know, from all walks of life that, you know, here's agriculture, you know, we're destroying the ecosystem, the only way to, uh, to keep us going here is to come to harmonize ourselves, to realign ourselves with the biosphere, because we're part of it, right? And 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 so, um, so so to to make that knowing, you know, more widespread, you know, without uh, you know, just just make it understood, and then when when panic breaks out, we know which direction to run. You know, so that's sort of. Uh, what I'm trying to 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 build, you know, is a groundwork of understanding. Thanks, Klaus. That's just where my thinking has been. <laughs> the cat, the catastrophe that that motivates people. Uh, uh, you mentioned um, victory gardens earlier. Something pulling people forward in a larger way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm more interested in a, a farmer using six uh, yards <clears throat> than I am in victory gardens uh, and, and then b making viable products out of that. I think that that's a pretty interesting thing. I, she's pretty remarkable. And, and I don't know if that's really, a, you know, how replicable her model is would be interesting to, to explore. It seems to me that we want to have both large projects and small ones, and we shouldn't talk down either. I, that's completely right. I just don't, you know, I, we've now hired a guy who speaks institution, and he can do a lot of things that I can't do. Absolutely. We totally should. Yeah, <clears throat> so we wanted to leave you on a high note, how, how are we going to do that? <laughs> Go out in the backyard and start digging. Yeah, I think change is happening. You know, that's all I think. Is anybody else afraid that Dill is going to reach out for, from that picture and grab you? That, that, that picture is always bothering <laughs>
Oh, yeah, I know, an inspiration. Um, be hopeful. Rebecca Solnit on Hope in The Guardian is uh, really super good right now. And she's got about 100,000 comments or something. And she's just said, hope is a resilient strategy, you know, and doom is a, is a, is a self-fulfilling strategy. When I, whenever I hear the word hope, I think of Johanna Macy and, you know, active hope as being absolutely essential, just sitting around in prayerful hope, you know, mm. so what? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we have exhausted the topic, have we? And very good. Good, thank you. I mean, I, I, class, we're obviously doing things that are good at different scales, and and you know, I respect the the scale at which you work. It's it's you know. I get kind of paranoid when I have to be around all the grown-ups and stuff like that you have to be with. So I, I work better on the edge. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Bobby. I'll be saying goodbye. Yeah, it, it it looks that way. It looks like we 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 are we're full. We are, I have the baton, so I'm speaking, okay? <laughs> I'm the host, whatever that means. But um it sounds like we're finished for the day. Pete said you need to leave early and um class is ready to go. Um so Thanks, Paul. we we can just sit and uh reflect on on what we've heard today um i'll just share mine it's just everything that was said is just kind of validating for where my own thinking is so i appreciate listening to the dis discussion mm -hmm. yeah well thank you thank you also for uh allowing us to do this yeah, yeah. okay bye-bye have a good week everybody thank you